Okay, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from the world. Uh, welcome to the weekly Mechie Alliance seminar series. Uh, my name is Brian Anthony, along with Teresa Worth and Irina, will be your host for today. And I'd like to do my great pleasure and introduce Professor Henry, uh, who's graciously sharing his time with us today to share his work in rethinking problems in thermal science and engineering from atoms to applications. Professor Henry is an associate professor in Mechie. Prior to joining mechanical engineering at MIT, he was at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, has a, a very esteemed career with uh, awards uh, from the National Science Foundation and the World Technology uh, Award for Energy. Uh, participants, please know that this is being recorded and uh, please hold your questions uh, till the end when you can raise your hand or type them via chat and we'll direct them to Professor Henry. Uh, so with that, um, please hold on to your, your, your thermal science hats. And uh, Professor Henry, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and, and, and take it away. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Can you all see the slides okay? Yes. Uh, and they're showing full screen? Yes. All right, great. Um, let me try to turn on this virtual laser pointer. All right, so um, <clears throat> today I want to talk about a, uh, just give a brief overview of some of the projects going on in my group. Uh, over the years that we've been doing research, there has been a, a theme that has emerged in our work, which is this notion of rethinking problems from the beginning. Uh, we've worked on a number of different problems, and our general approach tends to be that we go back to the beginning on, on old problems, uh, look for new opportunities, things that weren't tried before or something that may have changed since the last time it was attempted. And, uh, and in that way, we look for uh, new opportunities to do new things. And so the other key portion of that is that um, our research in, in many ways spans a very large span of orders of magnitude and length scale and energy and power. So we, we study heat transfer, that's our core expertise. We study it at the atomic level, um, angstrom level, and also study heat transfer at the very large macroscopic level relevant for industrial applications, you know, uh, grid scale power. So, you know, order of tens, tens to hundreds of meters. Um, <clears throat> and so we do, we do everything essentially in between that. Um, but the key is that we often take insights from the atomic level and utilize those to um, come up with new ideas for what we want to do at a large scale. So I'll try to highlight some of that as I go along. Um, before I jump into the research itself, um, I was told there are a number of students that often are on these, uh, these meetings. And so I wanted to share a little bit about my uh, career path. Uh, these are the faces of many key people, mentors that played key roles in me getting to where it is that I am today. Um, I had a very uh, great mentor, uh, Dr. Makola Abdullah, when I was an uh, undergraduate at Florida a and um, He's now president of uh, Virginia State University. Um, and when I got to MIT, um, uh, Dean Ike Colbert and Dean uh, Blanche Staten played an absolutely critical role in my being able to come here and go here for graduate school. Uh, they helped me find some funding to get through my first year. After that, I was able to get a uh, Department of Energy Computational Science Graduate Fellowship that covered me. The fellowship was critical as well because it gave me the freedom to work on what I wanted to work on rather than what my advisor had money for. Um, and that allowed me to bridge into a field that was rather was related but different than what my advisor had traditionally worked on. So I got to kind of carve my own niche. And then that ended up kind of fueling me and propelling me into uh, my own space uh, where, where I was able to, to make some significant contributions. Um, my advisor, Dr. Uh, professor Gong Chen, still a professor here, former department head, um, had a tremendous impact on my whole approach to problem solving and um, got amazing training here. I then did uh, essentially like three postdocs after that before starting as a faculty member at Georgia Tech. Uh, worked with, um, he's now a professor at the time, he was a uh, staff scientist at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, but uh, David Singh, 
uh, worked with uh, Chris Wolverton at Northwestern University. Um, then I went to the Department of Energy at RPE and worked with uh, Arun Majumdar, who was the first director. Uh, got mentored by Robbie Prasher, who was a program director there. And then went to Georgia Tech, um, had a number of great colleagues, uh, Dr. Sam, Sam Graham, Martin De Cola, and especially uh, Ken Sandage, who was from Material Science. He played an absolutely critical role in, in me, kind of, I won't, I won't say pivoting because I still do my bread and butter stuff, but uh, bridging into a new realm of specifically working on extremely high temperature applications. That was really his wheelhouse. And so I learned a ton from working with him, um, things that are, are not generally privy to people in mechanical engineering. And so, um, you know, this is just kind of the spread of a lot of really important people that played important roles in, in my development. Um, so <clears throat> what I want to talk about is, you know, two ends of the spectrum. I'm going to spend the first part of the talk talking about the physics of atomic vibrations. Um, I'd like to talk about how my group has developed some, um, some new theory, some new approaches for how to study and understand um, heat transfer at the at the atomic scale. Um, what's shown here in this plot is kind of like our master plot. In, in general, what you see here, you see amorphous materials, you see an alloy here. Uh, I could even put crystalline materials here. We have essentially one method that we've developed that's a unified method that can treat all these different classes of materials in one framework. Uh, prior to our invention of that um, framework, um, there was no single method that could describe all of this simultaneously, and you, you would usually see lots of quantitative and qualitative errors with respect to describing even one class of materials, but we get good agreement across the board, um, and it's largely because we went back and rethought the physics from, from the beginning. So I'll walk through how that works, um, and then I'll try to spend a good bit of time talking about a, a grid scale energy storage technology that we're developing. It's thermal storage, but in essence, it acts just like a battery takes in electricity, puts electricity back out. Um, this is probably the technology we're developing that I'm most excited about. Uh, so I'll try to spend a bit of time on this as well. Um, it's affectionately called sun in a box when you see that we're doing something at extremely high temperatures. All right, so for the first part, um, this notion of the physics of heat transfer at the atomic level, we generally call it phonon transport. Um, if you've never heard that word, I'm gonna first talk about what a phonon is. And specifically, there's this really important idea that has been around for a century or so called the phonon gas model. And there's a particular way that phonons are treated in a modeling framework. And um, I'll review what, that, what the assumptions are with that model. And then that will help make sense of why there were a lot of problems with the models that were outgrowths of that particular uh, base physical picture. And then I'll introduce you know, the key problem that comes about when you take that viewpoint. And then I'll show you essentially how we solved it or how we uh, overcame that issue. And I'd love to spend more time on this. I don't have much time, but I'll show you maybe an example or two of some non-intuitive phenomena that are outgrowths of taking a new viewpoint of a different physical picture. Um, things behave differently than you would think. So what's a phonon? So if you imagine starting with a solid, um, just a regular uh, crystalline solid material, the atoms are constantly in motion, they're constantly vibrating and moving. And you can break those motions up into a summation of individual plane waves. If you, if you, you can actually go and solve the equations of motion in the limit that you treat all those interactions between atoms as though they are just a bunch of um, rigid masses with springs in between them. If that's the case, you have a system of equations that you can solve analytically. What you'll get is that you'll have a bunch of normal modes or uh, and they will look like plane waves. And they'll look like plane waves for one particular reason, which is that in a homogeneous crystalline solid, all the atoms are essentially indistinguishable, or at least there's a basis set of atoms that are indistinguishable. So one group of atoms um, is essentially replicated on the entire lattice. So every atom has essentially the same vibration. So therefore, the modes of vibration have to be periodic. They have to all look the same for all atoms. They can't, there's no break in symmetry. Now, um, so the traditional view of what a phonon in is, is, is largely rooted in that. It's rooted in this idea that phonons are plane waves. And so um, if you take some of these plane waves, you add them together uh, with slightly different wavelengths, slightly different frequencies, what you will get is a wave packet. And this wave packet is now a localized bump of displacement of the atoms that moves in time. And so you get like a packet of motion that can move through the material. 
Now this packet of this wave packet looks like a little particle, so to speak. And so people made an analogy to treating phonons like they're particles and treating them like quantum mechanical particles, which have energy h bar omega. They have a wavelength, which is like the average wavelength of these waves that you added together. Once you got a wavelength, you can talk about a wave vector. You can describe a direction of the waves in the crystal. Um, and then they also have a speed. So there's a phase velocity, which is the ratio of omega to k, and then a group velocity, which is the derivative of omega with respect to k. And the group velocity is the important one because if you look at the particle, the speed that this bump moves at is this group velocity, not the phase velocity. So anyway, this whole framework's been around. People have been using this for a long time. But let me now tell you about what is this phonon gas model. So the idea is that if you want to understand how energy moves through a material, through these vibrations of atoms, you, instead of focusing on the vibrations themselves, focus on these phonons, focus on these packets. You make an analogy and treat the packets like they're gas particles. And so the gas particles fly around and they can now be treated just like a gas. You can use the same theory you use for uh, a gas, which is like kinetic theory. So you invoke an analogy and you say, okay, well, if in order to describe the heat flow through molecules, what I would have done is I'd have taken one half mv squared, which is the kinetic energy of an atom or molecule, multiply by the velocity, this is a vector, divide by the volume, and this gives me the heat flux associated with a molecule. Now you make that same analogy for phonons, you say, okay, well, they don't have any mass per se, so instead I'm going to use the quantum mechanical energy, h bar omega, then multiply by velocity, divide by volume. This gives me now the heat flux associated with a phonon. This expression right here is at the core of essentially 100 years of modeling of phonon transport. This is like the core engine. Like they always start with this first line. And nobody had ever really questioned this one line because there's all a lot of outcomes. People do a lot of stuff with this expression and go all kinds of places with it. At the end of the day, this line is not derived from really any basic principle. It's just by analogy. So you have to make this particle analogy for this to make sense. Um, what you then get out of that is then you can describe a property like thermal conductivity and you get basically the same answer you would have gotten for a gas. You get that you need the specific heat of the particles, the velocities, and the mean free pass, the average distance they travel before they scatter with something or before they hit something. So these particles can interact with each other. They can affect each other. They have a certain distance they can travel before they transmit their energy to other modes. And what's different about these than you know molecules is that these particles can be created and destroyed out of thin air, so to speak. They don't, they're, they're, um, um, the energy is conserved, but the number of particles isn't. So they can transfer energy and they can interact with boundaries or alloying elements and different things. And these are, these are, this is the basic physical picture for phonon transport that's been around for many, many years. Now, the reason people believe in it is, in short, it works. If you look at a crystalline material, these are predictions from first principles. Uh, calculations and these are the experiments and you get excellent agreement between theory and experiments very consistently so a lot of people you know we have great reason to believe in this um, it also does a great job of explaining a key phenomena you see when you start doing nano uh, heat nanoscale heat transfer if you start making something small then that means the mean free pass the average distance that these phonons can travel before they hit a boundary starts to shrink and therefore the thermal conductivity starts to shrink so you can, this here is uh, the thermal conductivity of some silicon nanowires. As you shrink them, the thermal conductivity decreases. You can see if you drill holes in a piece of silicon, the thermal conductivity starts to decrease because now the distance that phonons can travel before they run into the edge of a hole is now uh, getting smaller. And so this phonon gas model makes sense of all of this. And so it's a great model for that. Where it breaks down though, is when you start talking about disorder. Um, when you now have uh, a material that is no longer a crystalline solid. So in this case, like an alloy, right? You have different types of atoms and they're randomly distributed on that lattice. Um, what you end up happening, what ends up happening is you see very significant deviations in the agreement between theory. Here, this is ab initio theory, again, from first principles. Now these two lines no longer agree with the experimental data here, which are the dots. And then what's even stranger is even if you use fitting parameters, you just use the functional form that you would get from the phonon gas model treat the mean free pass as free parameters, you still can't ex explain the data, which is even worse, right? So even with fitting parameters, I can't get it right. This is a great hint from mother nature that something is wrong with our perspective. Um, 
similar things happen if you have disorder in the form of breaking symmetry by having like an interface between two different materials. Uh, if we try to describe the interface resistance or interface conductance between different materials, again, here's theory, you see lines all over the place, and then the data is not matched by the theory. All right, and so we again see big discrepancies between theory and experiment when we have systems that are disordered. In short, I'll just jump to the, the punchline. What we found is wrong with this model is that when you break symmetry, what happens is that the phonons no longer look like plane waves anymore. And that's the core problem. And once they don't look like plane waves, then the whole particle analogy breaks down and everything begets, uh, becomes problematic. Um, so what happens, this is an example of, uh, these are these little lines you see here on the different atoms in a, in a lattice. These represent the vectors telling you how that atom will move as it participates in a particular normal mode or a particular solution to the equations of motion. So some of them still kind of look like plane waves. You see some periodicity here where you see the, 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 the lines go back and forth in a wave-like motion. So you will get some modes that still behave like that. Those we call propagons because they seem like they're like propagating phonons, like the normal idea of the, of, of the, um, of the plane waves. The problem is the major these are not the majority of the modes. These are a small fraction. Now the majority of the modes look like this, look like random vectors pointing in all kinds of different directions. This is an alloy. This is an amorphous material. The same classifications of modes show up in alloys, even though they have crystalline structure, but disordered composition or disordered structure and uniform composition. In either case, you get these new classifications of modes that show up called uh, diffusons and even locons where you have localized vibrations where only like a small group of atoms are participating in that mode. So this is a major departure from the normal physical picture we had before. When you now go to an interface, uh, again, interesting things happen. You get some modes that actually extend through both materials, extended modes. You get some modes that actually stop at the interface and only go a little bit into the other side. Some modes are isolated on one side, and then you get localized modes right at the interface, which you call interfacial modes. So you get, again, new classifications of modes. They're not all plane waves. So now we have to diversify. We have to open up the physical picture to now be more inclusive of other types of behaviors other than just plane waves. So in essence, I'll skip this and skip the math, but in essence, that's what we did, is we went back to the problem from and re restarted from the beginning. We got rid of this assumption of the modes being plane waves, and instead we rewrote the theory in terms of just the atoms themselves and their vibrations. We use a framework called lattice dynamics where we actually uh, solve for the different normal modes, and we don't care what the normal modes look like. We then take those normal modes and we decompose what's called a molecular dynamic simulation, actual simulation of the anharmonic, non-harmonic motion, non-linear motion of the atoms. We decompose it as and use the normal modes as a basis set to do the decomposition. When we do it this way, we've essentially not lost no information and we had to make no assumptions. And then now what we have is a correlation-based framework where we actually measure how correlated two modes are. And that actually tells us how strongly they contribute to the thermal connectivity. So in this framework, there's no, there's no concept of scattering. There's no concept of anything, particles running into anything. All of that's gone. We only have normal modes and the normal modes interact with each other and we simply measure how strongly they interact in time. And that way it's much more general. We can do cases that are extremely disordered, crystalline, and so now or, or, or fully, fully ordered or disordered, it doesn't matter. Our approach is completely agnostic to what it even is. It can be a molecule and our, our theory works all the same way. Oops. So in short, we call this theory green Kubo modal analysis. Um, here's again, some agreement we've gotten with theory and experiment. I need to remake this plot and put some crystals on here so you can see it goes out several or more orders of magnitude. They all fall right on the line. Um, we are in the process. This is, this is not our theory. This is other theories uh, trying to do interfacial heat, uh, heat conduction. We're still working on trying to demonstrate this. Making a interatomic potential for an interface is really challenging. So that's the part we're uh, working through right now, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to also show that the same theory essentially applied to an interface gives you similar agreement. Um, when we did this for an alloy, this is that case I showed you where with from first principles doesn't agree with the theory, um, uh, with the experiments. Here's the fitting parameters, doesn't agree with the experiments. And our green Kubo 
modal analysis gets it spot on. What I'm most proud of with this data is actually we did the theory before they did the experiments. So we were, it was actually predictive. So we actually uh, predicted these curves and didn't change it. And, and they went and did the experiments and it was, it was spot on. Um, what this plot on the left is showing you is this is a measure of how many of the modes are actually propagating like or like look like plane waves as you change the alloy composition. So what happens is initially when it's a pure crystal on one side of the, the plot, or on this side, all the modes are plane wave modes. They are all 100% propagating. This is the periodicity in those vectors. They're fully periodic. But as soon as you break the symmetry and start adding a few alloying elements, you see that this drops and you get almost no periodicity um, once you start making it an alloy. So this, again, has helped us realize, you know, we need a different physical picture. One of the other non-intuitive things that came out of this is when you think about interfaces, um, there was a, a, a number of theory, a bunch of theory that looked at um, when you have an interface, you have a, the idea was you have a particle that's going to bounce off the interface and it's got some probability of being reflected or transmitted. Um, in essence, we think that that physical picture is, is flawed. What goes with that physical picture is that if there's a probability of scattering, then that probability is bounded by one, right? The most you could ever transmit is 100%. If that's true, then that means there would be an intrinsic upper limit on the conductance you could ever get between two materials. And what we found, we actually, I should throw the experimental data, we actually have confirmation in this system that uh, here's the 100% transmission limit. We can, we've actually shown that there are materials that exceed this limit and all, uh, and our theory actually predicts a value quite, quite a bit higher uh, than this 100% transmission limit. And this is a great indication that, again, the theory itself has a problem. Um, real quick, I'll just mention we are also very, very deep in working on trying to develop accurate models to describe these interactions between uh, different phonons and, and, and the different interactions between atoms. Um, here's a bunch of different interatomic potentials. These are empirical functions that are supposed to describe how the atoms and silicon interact. Here is the thermal conductivity versus temperature, and you can see it's all over the map. This is log scale. So you can get different interatomic potentials giving you wildly different answers. Um, in short, we are trying to develop methods so that we can get methods that will tell you the same answer that you get from first principles, but with um, a million times less computational cost. Um, so here's now the problem with a lot of those things, those, those models I showed previously. The experiments are here. DFT agrees with the experiments, but you see all these models are not able to describe the frequencies of the modes correctly. They're all over the map. Um, when you look at the errors in the forces, they're very significant. Um, I'll move faster here. In short, we think we have a pretty good solution for this problem. Um, again, I said we're like a million times faster than doing it with DFT, and we're spot on in terms of describing thermal conductivity and the dispersion, the frequencies. And so we've made some very significant strides on this. If someone's interested in how this works, I, I'd be happy to answer this question in, in the Q&A. I'd be happy to come back to it. So we've done it for more than one material. Um, it works quite well, and I'll, I'll um, move on to the second part of my talk which is more about macroscopic stuff. So one of the biggest problems in our energy infrastructure in terms of wanting to decarbonize is uh, energy storage. Uh, simply put, we need energy storage because if you want to run the grid on solar and wind, which are now quite cheap and in many places cheaper than fossil, um, the problem is you don't get the electricity when you want it. If you tried to run the entire grid on, on it, you would uh, run into problems where if you tried to make the fossil resources compensate in some way, um, you do damage to them, trying to ramp them very fast. Like as soon as the sun goes down, it's too fast for a gigawatt scale ramp on the, on the fossil technologies. So um, there's like some rather intrinsic limits that you can get to uh, without energy storage. So we're working on the energy storage problem. Um, we're doing it in a way that will sound totally non-intuitive and may probably if you've taken a thermodynamics class, it's going to sound stupid. Um, what, you, what we're doing is going from electricity to heat back to electricity. And the reason that would sound stupid is because we expend most of our effort going from heat to electricity the first time. And when we do so, we pay a very big thermodynamic penalty. We lose generally more than half the energy we wasted. So if you then now go electricity back to heat, you can do that at essentially an almost 100% efficiency. The problem is when you go back from heat to electricity a second time, you're going to pay another big penalty, another like 50%. So it sounds kind of dumb to do this, um, but I'll tell you why. The only reason we would ever do this is because 
the cost of storing heat is like 100 times cheaper than storing electricity. So even though you pay like another 50% penalty on efficiency, it's actually worth it. And it sounds very non-intuitive to say I'm going to throw that much energy away. But once the energy is cheap enough, it's actually more cost effective to throw some of it away and store it insanely cheaply than to try and actually save it and do that more expensively. So in essence, that's what we're doing. Um, I'll skip this. This just kind of gives the fundamental argument for why it makes sense. Um, but let me just walk you through this simple logic here, just so you can understand how cheap we're talking. Um, if you imagine trying to store energy in something like liquid silicon, you take the heat capacity, cost of metallurgical grade silicon, which is about 98% pure, is about buck fifty a kilogram. Imagine you store the energy in the sensible heat of silicon, meaning you take silicon from one temperature, let's say it's already liquid, and you heat it up to another temperature that's 500 degrees hotter. You put in energy to do that, and then you can extract energy when you let it cool back down 500 degrees. So if you cycle it in that way, the amount of en uh, the cost you would have per unit energy would come out at about $11 per kilowatt hour, but that's thermal energy. If your conversion is about 50% efficient, that's a factor of two higher than that. That's about $22 a kilowatt hour electric. Compare that with lithium ion batteries, which are slated to maybe get to $150 a kilowatt hour electric. Pump hydro is at $75 a kilowatt hour electric. So this is very, very cheap energy storage. This is quite a bit lower um, <clears throat> than the cost of lithium ion or other options. If you go to another thing like, like liquid iron, you know, if you take scrap steel, you can get even cheaper than that. You can get down to $3, right? So you can store energy insanely cheaply if you store it thermally. And so this is the direction we've been looking at going. Um, if, if you've never really thought about what happens with storing energy at large scales, this may not be obvious, but you know, the first thing you might think is, you know, if I put a cup of hot coffee on a table, it starts out hot, but an hour later, it's gonna be cooled down. Um, same thing would happen if you store heat. It, the heat is gonna leak out and it's gradually gonna cool down. However, the time scale, the time it takes for it to leak out is proportional, it's related to the surface area to volume ratio. So as you make a tank of something storing heat extremely large, this is order 10 meters in diameter, order 10 meters tall, it's got tens of thousands of tons of liquid salt inside. The time constant, the time it takes for this thing to cool, cool down is on the order of months. So you can heat it up and it's not cooling down. You won't measure much of a temperature change like a week later, right? Because the, certainly the volume is so large. So you can lose less than about a percent of the energy per day as long as you're cycling your battery pretty frequently. The heat leakage can be negligible. Um, this is the part I wanted to mention about our atomic level insight. Um, we'd like to store something like silicon. Silicon doesn't melt till 1400 degrees C. Iron melts at 1500 degrees C. This is so hot, it's glowing white hot. If you imagine trying to store one of these elements in a tank made out of metal, it's not gonna work. And generally it's not gonna work because metals interact with other metals and they will form some kind of alloy. And so a metal will, dis or a metal will dissolve another metal. So imagine trying to store water in a, in a tank made out of sugar, right? It's gonna dissolve the walls and very quickly the tank wall will go away and all your, salt, all your sugary water will, just, will go everywhere. So our insight was instead, we should be looking at materials where you take one of these elements and pair them with one of these elements so that you make a ceramic. If you do that, then you can actually form materials that are thermodynamically stable with respect to certain liquids, certain liquid metals. You can actually make something that has no chemical interaction and forms no corrosive byproducts if you start with a ceramic. So our key new idea that we brought here was the idea of doing liquid metal with a ceramic-based infrastructure. And ceramic-based infrastructure may sound uh, difficult to make, it is, but we have overcome a lot of the challenges with doing that. What we wanna use it for is an energy storage approach described here in this figure. It's gonna sound insane when I, when I talk about it, but um, we are building a prototype. It seems like it's gonna work. So we bring in electricity from essentially any source you want. It doesn't matter whether it's renewable or not, but ideally we're focused on wanting to store renewable energy. Start with a tank of liquid silicon. This silicon, this silicon is what we call our cold tank. But this tank is glowing white hot. It's at 1900 degrees C. When you are ready to charge your battery, you pump this liquid out, pump it past a bunch of heaters that are glowing white hot that are fueled by this electricity you want to store. The silicon heats up even more to about 2400 degrees C. This is about the temperature 
of an incandescent light bulb filament, so glowing white hot. So you store it in the hot tank. When you're now ready to get your electricity back, you can leave this liquid in here you know, for a while, weeks if you want. When you're ready to get the electricity back, you pump it out through this heat engine, and then you convert it back to electricity, and then it comes out cold and goes back in at 1900 degrees C. The heat engine is what's unique. The heat engine is different here. So it's not a turbine. Turbines can't operate this hot. Uh, most metals will turn to liquid <laughs> by this temperature. Instead, what we're using is photovoltaics as the heat engine. So what's happening here is we're actually converting some of the light that comes off of the, therm the infrastructure. All the pipes carrying that liquid are glowing white hot. And so we're scavenging the highest frequency light off of that uh, that's being emitted. And we are converting that to electricity. These cells, these PV cells are not normal. They've got mirrors on the back. So the majority of the light is, is actually light you can't see, which is infrared. We send that light right back to the infrastructure to keep it hot and we preserve it. That's where the name sun in a box came from is this idea that it's glowing white hot and most of the light is trapped inside of this box, which is well insulated. So even though we don't convert most of the light on the first pass through the photovoltaic, we don't lose it. We use a mirror to reflect it back and we keep it and preserve it and we recycle it. That's part of what makes it efficient. One of the first questions you should probably ask yourself is, well, how are you going to pump it? Um, pumping liquid at those temperatures sounds absolutely insane. Um, it kind of is, but we, uh, we can do it. So one of our big steps forward was in figuring out that you actually can make a pump, a mechanical pump out of uh, ceramics, that we can join ceramics and make leak tight joints for liquid metal. What you're seeing in the right here, this was an experiment we did where we were pumping liquid tin at about almost 1400 degrees C. We used a uh, all ceramic pump with all ceramic seals and uh, we were able to show that this kind of approach can work. And the only reason we stopped at 1400 degrees C here uh, was because of uh, power limitations. The materials actually could have gone much hotter. Um, and so we've actually pumped at 2000 degrees C. Uh, we don't have a paper on it just yet, but I have the data. We did it in my lab and we pumped silicon at 2000 C. Um, let's keep going. Oops. Let me wrap up pretty quickly here. Um, so we've done a number of experiments at 2000 C investigating the materials and the, the seals, uh, demonstrating that they can work. Uh, I'll move ahead pretty quickly. One of the main reasons we're interested in looking at multi-junction photovoltaics instead of a turbine has to do with lower cost. We get similar efficiency, but not uh, the same efficiency. Arguably, you could use a turbine at lower temperatures and get 60% efficiency. However, that turbine doesn't exist. On the other hand, there are PV manufacturers that would love to make these PV, these PV modules for us. Um, so there's much more interest from, from industry on that side, and it's a lower cost to do the development. Here's a, a kind of specked out system so you can see what it would look like. This is a gigawatt hour of electricity storage. So you can see the general size of the system. This is like 20 meters in diameter, 20 meters tall. The pumps for this thing are only like a foot in diameter. So imagine an all graphite pump. It's 20 meters long. It's got a long shaft that dips down and sucks out silicon. Um, we've made things like this before. These kinds of pumps exist already. Not made out of graphite, but they exist for molten salt. So none of this is really new. It's just new materials that are already manufactured at scale, uh, putting them together in unique ways to do something something different. Um, we're building this in my lab. We have a giant vacuum chamber that's five feet in diameter, 12 feet long. What I should say about this one key thing is this whole system's held in an inert environment. So you definitely can't get this hot with something like graphite in the air. It will just burn. Uh, you'll ox it'll oxidize. Instead, we keep it in a shell and keep it exposed to argon so that it won't have those, those interactions. And we are, we've got a project with ARPA-E now uh, demonstrating this in a prototype uh, scale. One other thing we're working on using liquid metal is another approach we just got funding for, which is uh, methane cracking. So this is making hydrogen without making CO2. You take in methane, you bubble it up through something like liquid tin. Tin does not interact, has no chemical interaction with carbon or hydrogen, so it's completely inert. The inside the bubbles, the methane decomposes, turns into hydrogen, and you get a solid carbon particle that floats on the surface of the tin. Then because we can pump liquid tin at extremely high temperatures, we can move the carbon out and actually do the separations uh, and do lots of heat recuperation to make this efficient. So we're also about to start building this prototype as well in my lab. The last thing I wanna to touch on um, really, really quickly, I know I'm uh, probably almost out of time, but um, there's a um, 
paper that hopefully will be forthcoming soon um, that talks about uh, what are the top five problems that we think are exist in our domain and thermal that involve thermal energy. One of them is, of course, this energy storage problem, uh, but also there's this issue of EVs and batteries um, in, in, in electric vehicles. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of the battery usage is used for space conditioning. So there is a thought that you could actually make a thermal battery that's on board that you charge at home, but actually more densely stores the energy you need for space heating and cooling. Um, there's a number of ideas out there for, for thermal storage, but I think there's some really important impacts that that could have. Uh, one problem that's not very well known is we actually have to invent a new way of doing cooling and air conditioning. Um, it's projected that, uh, so basically the problem is that for an air conditioner, um, there's, these are com, you know, consumer devices, they have leaks and they break sometimes. And it turns out that the, 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 um, the media that are used as the refrigerants are actually a very high global warming potential. So when they leak out, they actually have a very big impact on global warming, much, much greater than CO2 per molecule. And when you account for the uptake in, in the spread of air conditioning in developing nations, it's projected that by about 2050, those refrigerants could be 10 to 25% of overall global warming. Um, they're not today. Uh, they're, they're just getting to a place where they're um, uh, becoming significant. So we have to reinvent cooling. So this is a big problem. Uh, not many people are focused on it, so we're trying to essentially recruit and get people interested in working on this problem. Another area is industry. So industry needs to be decarbonized. Fortunately, it's just a couple of big industries that have, have are, are responsible for the majority of the CO2 emissions. That's cement, steel. Uh, this is actually incorrect. Uh, cement is almost like 10%. 10 um, uh, steel is 4%. Aluminum and hydrogen are some of the biggest industries that need to be decarbonized. So. Uh, there's a lot of heat that's used in these industries, and, and it, we, it's important that we go back and rethink these things, these industries. Um, there's the issue of space conditioning in the sense of zonal heating and cooling. You know, we end up cooling the entire uh, room or the entire building, when in reality, think of it like lighting. You know, you really only need the lights where you're doing the work, and so are there approaches where we could just cool the person rather than cooling the entire uh, area or the entire room or the entire volume. Um, another problem is long distance transmission of heat. We can transmit electricity over miles. We can't transmit heat over miles. If we could, we actually have a ton of waste heat. And there's a bunch of waste heat from power plants that could, it's in the right temperature range where it could be used for space heating. Um, people do this already with cogen. The problem is if we could move it much further cheaply in the same way that we can like power lines, we could actually route heat and use it for heating and instead of trying to convert a, a small fraction of it to electricity, just use it as heat. Um, so this is another big problem. Um, I'll stop here. I want to acknowledge a bunch of former students and collaborators. Uh, thankful for support from NSF, RPE, ONR, and the uh, Solar Energy Technologies Office. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff I glossed over, so I'll be hoping people ask about it. I send you, Professor Henry, the, the virtual and the physical clap. Yeah, that was a phenomenal talk covering a sort of a, a range from the, the sub, uh, the atomic level out to the, the macro scale. We do have a lot of questions, um, but I want to ask my, my first burning question, if you will, um, humor intended. Where do you store a sun in a box? You know, what are the, the constraints that allow you to deploy? Um, it, can you do it in residential areas or it has to be sort of far removed? Um. My suggestion, I think it would be smart to store, put sun in a box um, in the same kinds of places you put power plants, which are generally not in residential areas. They generally emit a lot of CO2 and you don't want to be in places where there'd be any kind of insurance liabilities. So generally they can, they need to be out of, out of the, cent, the center of a city, so to speak. But um, one of the benefits of the technology is, is it, it's that it is not really geographically limited. Um, there are a number of other energy storage technologies that require a particular geography. Like they can only exist where there's certain ground conditions or in the case of like pumped hydro, you've got to have two bodies of water that are at two different heights. So that's the issue with pumped hydro. I mean, we'd love to do just do pumped hydro, right? It's cheap. Um, problem is you can't put it where you want it. It's too expensive to build a body of water where you want it. Um, so instead you got to rely on the natural geography. Um, there's another approach called compressed air energy storage. They can make salt caverns, but it presupposes you have the right geology where you can mine and get the salt out of there with water 
very cheaply to make a ginormous cavity under the earth. So um, there are a range of ways you can do things, but the point is there's certain geography that works. Here, um, you essentially just need at least good enough geography that can support something very heavy, just like you would for a normal power plant. Very good, thank you. Uh, so let me go to the, the questions. Uh, we have a bunch in the Q&A and chat, and I see a raised hand, but let me try to take them in the order they came in. Um, one of the questions, uh, what amorphous materials have you experimentally tested and how do you produce your amorphous test specimens? Um, so we, my group doesn't get into the measurements of thermal conductivity. We rely on some other groups that specialize in that. Um, the amorphous materials, where they get them, some of them are, um, I think PVD deposited, some are CVD deposited. Um, I'm not sure if they also use MBE sometimes, um, but uh, there are other groups that specialize in the fabrication of those. I could maybe provide a reference or so, or two to, to, to those approaches. Um, then there are other groups that specialize in the measurement. So uh, a lot of people use a, a technique called TDTR or uh, FDTR, which are this time domain thermal reflectance where they put uh, or even three omega. There's a number of techniques that people use to do that. So we don't really specialize in that part. We take the experimental data um, essentially as is. We do work with the experimentalists in terms of uh, understanding the details of those the, that those data sets and to what extent we try to compare it to the highest fidelity. Yeah, very, good. Mm -hmm. very good. Uh, another question here from David. Uh, have you worked with Professor Sadaway on high temperature battery energy storage? Energy storage. Um, I have not worked with him yet, but I've met him and would love to work with him. Um, I just think we, we need to cross path again, cross, cross paths again and get a chance to talk in detail about some, some cool ideas. Hopefully soon in the post COVID era. Yeah. Um, um, what pressures do you need to operate with liquid metal pumps? Oh, excellent. Excellent question. Um, in general, our system is at one atmosphere, so we don't pressurize the system um, in terms of the uh, pressure needed to pump. Uh, the majority of the head you need to come, come up with is the head to get out of the tank, which is roughly about an atmosphere or so. Um, it's just rho GH. The pressure to get through heat exchangers and all those things are sub one atmosphere. So it's just one or two atmospheres is, is plenty. It's about the okay. pressure, similar to the, uh, the pumps that we use have similar requirements to like the pumps that are used in uh, fire hoses. Similar scale and, and pressure. Very good. Um, so another question here. Uh, first was thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned that some phonons like locons are not plane waves. So mathematically speaking, what are they really? That is, when you solve the equation of motion, do these non-plane wave photons take a particular mathematical or physical form or function? Um, in short, no, they do not have a particular function. It's kind of the wild, wild west when it comes to normal modes. There's no real restriction on like why they have to do anything. So what happens is you put together a system of atoms, you solve the equation, the atoms are interconnected, then you solve the equations of motion. And what that tells you is just, here's how the atoms have decided to figure out how they're gonna move given how you put them together. So there's no real constraint. Like you can get, you can get modes that are in between these things that are like partially localized, like maybe a hundred atoms are vibrating. So you can get anything in between that whole spectrum. Um, you know, in general, there's no particular functional form. Uh, what we found, though, is that the larger locons tend to have the, uh, the strongest contributions. Very interesting. Uh, another question here from, from Richard. Um, what are the consequences of the magnetic properties in interactions of stored and flowing molten iron? Yeah, I mean, in theory, um, so we're, we're so hot, we wouldn't dare bring a, ma a magnet anywhere near this. Um, <laughs> But uh, in theory, yes, there could be some magnetic fields. Uh, one way that people have pumped liquid metals in the past is with electromagnetic pumps. And uh, with, there's a whole energy conversion approach with uh, magnetohydrodynamics. Um, in general, we are so hot and, and those approaches are so inefficient by comparison to what we're doing. We haven't really entertained much of that. Uh, but yeah, it is there. There is, there is some effect. Uh, but it should be pretty small. We, we'd prefer to use a mechanical pump that's, you know, in the high 80s to 90% efficient. I think we'll take one more question. Um, and uh, I think uh, Rebob or Rebob um, had their hand raised. Um, yes, Rebob, you should be able to unmute and ask your question now. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the talk. I had, I guess, two questions. 
Um, one is on failure modes within the system. Um, where do you foresee potential failure modes in the overall system and how would um, you go about um, kind of addressing them when this is in live operation? And then the second question was more the usage of the system. So where do you see the sun in the box getting used at the utility scale? Would that be kind of long-term seasonal storage or um, kind of cycling once or twice every day like most lithium ion uh, systems are used? Um, just kind of how does it come into the regulation and the policies in place, um, perhaps within the US for the usage of energy storage for grid level storage? Yeah, great questions. Um, let me try to answer the second one first. Um, I do not envision this for seasonal storage, um, particularly because we do have that approximately 1% per day. I mean, we can we can lower it arbitrarily low and make it 0.1% per day, but the point is we're always leaking energy. And, you know, if we're at 1% per day, you wait 100 days and we basically lost almost all the energy. So um, we, we're probably not well suited for seasonal storage. We are more suited for, the more frequently you cycle it, the better the economics for us. Um, and, and our, our system is, you know, at least with silicon, right, it's two tanks. So each tank is essentially isothermal, so you can cycle it as much as you want. It's not like you're thermally cycling the infrastructure. Every component is essentially at one location, remains isothermal as you're cycling through charging and discharging. Um, so that's that. I, I anticipate it'll be likely used, uh, probably most cost effective thing is to pair it with a renewable resource, have it be deployed and get it, uh, let's say you have a solar developer, they put in an application to get a PPA um, for providing electricity that they buy one of these units to couple with it. And what they get in return is then they're gonna get capacity payments and they get to do arbitrage and they get to basically bid in at being able to, just, to provide renewable energy at any time um, in, a, in a coupled in a hybrid way with this system added to it and then they just, they operate both or they, they, they buy both together. Um, that's what I anticipate maybe one of the most cost effective ways of doing it. Uh, to your first question on uh, failure modes, you know, biggest failure mode one could immediately think of is, you know, you get some leak, uh, maybe the tank breaks or something like that. Uh, generally, and that, that has happened um, with this type of technology. This technology in, in general is very similar to molten salt energy storage for concentrated solar power. You have these giant tanks with very hot liquid inside. The liquid in that case is nowhere near as hot as we are. However, it's sufficiently hot that it, the, the effect that it would have of getting out is not really all that different. Um, meaning it's so hot that if the liquid got on a person, it'd kill them. So mm -hmm. generally what you do is, um, what they do is they, they build these tanks inside of a bit of a trench so that the tank fails, all the liquid still remains contained in a, in a, um, in a, a recess below ground. Um, other than that, you end up having to go in and try to repair uh, if something breaks. One of the benefits, though, of using something like silicon um, and iron is that it's so hot, right, that as soon as it leaks out, the radiative transfer to the surroundings is so quick, it actually very quickly freezes. So we've done experiments. We've had, we've had tanks crack and break, um, particularly where they break is on um, um, when the whole thing freezes. But even when we're hotter than that, we've had a leak before and the leak can't get very far because as it's moving through the insulation, it's cooling and then it freezes and becomes solid, which actually prevents more from getting out. So that's a bit of a, um, a fail safe to some extent. Um, but in general, you build some infrastructure around it as like a catch pan. Very good, thank you. Uh, Professor Henry, thank you again for your time and the phenomenal work and, and wonderful presentation and thank you for all the, the questions. Um, Thanks this for has been a, a, a great opportunity. Uh, so again, everybody, I think you know, this is our, our weekly engagement with our, our faculty, our students and our external uh, partners and collaborators. Uh, next week, please join us same time, same channel uh, for a talk on uh, cybersecurity, uh, toward, towards security by design of connected and automated vehicles, cyber and physical threats, mitigations and architectures. A, a recent uh, PhD graduate, Dr. Sue, uh, working with Sanjay Sarma will be presenting then. Uh, again, Professor Henry, again, thank you for your time, the virtual and physical clap. Um, participants and everybody, if you have um, recommendations on people that you would like to hear from in the department or outside of the department, 
uh, please send us an email, let us know. Or if you'd like to self volunteer, uh, do let us know. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you everybody for your time. Uh, stay safe and have a good remainder of your day. Professor Henry again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a good one. The meeting does not want me to end. Okay. <laughs>